lands are in ruin. Your spirits are broken. Your temples are burning, and soon I, Necron, shall fulfill my destiny as your new god. All of Grim Earth shall fall to their knees before me, lest there is someone fool enough to take up the gauntlet. All right, what is going on, everybody? It's your boy, Big Dave Martell, back with another episode of The Bog. We have a very special episode today. Give me one second. I'm hearing some feedback. It's actually on my end here. Yeah, technical difficulties. You'd think I'd be uh, over those types of things by now after doing this for years, but apparently I'm not. So anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We have a very special episode tonight. As you guys saw, guys, buy books. Go over to thebizarchives.com and check it out. We got some new books available. We have the case book of Patrick Midnight, a OG horror noir by our boy Arbogast, available over there. You can follow the links and go buy it on Amazon or your favorite book retailer. Follow us on Twitter and Telegram at the Bizarchives if you like the traditions of sword and sorcery, cosmic horror, cyberpunk, sci-fi, and beyond. Old books, old reprints from yesteryear, as well as up-and-coming uh, contemporary authors. So go check that out, thebizarchives.com. We have a really great substack at theobelisk.substack.com, and you can sign up for five bucks a month, get free ebooks every single month, all of our releases. Plus, you can sign up for free and just get updates and all kinds of cool articles about all your favorite authors from, from history and all kinds of great stuff. So go over there, get signed up, help support the machine, helps us grow and all that good stuff. And as you guys saw on the trailer there, Grim Earth, we have a video game project. So go check that out t.me slash grim earth you can also follow the links at the bizarchives.com you can also check out my other podcast over there at culture dads that's culture with a k culture dads.com go follow the links get signed up to the gum road and then you get so many great perks such as hardback copies of the imperium press catalog as well as culture dads every single week you can't beat it you can't beat it you get to hear me every single week me and mike do deep dives into retro and pop culture for our people our folk guys like us stuff that we like so go check that out you're gonna love it and um without further ado we have a great lineup my buddies my friends the great folk from the Nerona society we have mark keith william three of the biggest brains i don't even know i don't even know how we're going to be able to support i have to get, get an upgrade on my internet to support all this big brain power we got here today but we're going to talk about something that's a little bit spicy a little bit controversial at least it shouldn't be but it is something that needs to be brought up, needs to be talked about. And who else better than these guys here? We got Mark, Keith, and William Reeves. Great guys. I can't, man, this is going to be a good one. So without further ado, we're going to do a roundtable so these guys can introduce themselves, tell you about their books and their accomplishments and all the awesome stuff they do. We're going to go Mark, Keith, and then William. Then we're going to get started. Go ahead, fellas. All right, everybody. I'm Mark Pereira. I'm happy to be on this show. I love doing the show with Dave, man. It's so awesome. So, fun, so much fun when we get to do this. Uh, I've been the author of many, a whole bunch of books. I've done the Otis book and Ivan Runer and Ivan Runer 2 and Ostretta and all this stuff. And we've been studying lore for a long time. I've been working with these guys for a long time. They're good friends of mine. And I just think that I'm really excited to do this. This panel discussion is going to be fantastic. Hi, I'm Keith Osgood. Um, likewise, really excited to be here. I'm an Old Norse translator uh, and Edic scholar. Uh, as Mark said, we've done some collaboration in the past on some of his works, done some consulting for Old Norse. Um, and then recently I came out with my uh, first book, my translation of Wolvespa. Um, really excited about that. If you're interested, you can check that out. Um, it's for sale on Amazon. Tons of notes go through both manuscripts that provide the Old Norse, the English, cross-reference it with all the other Eddic poems, with other contemporary scholarship. Um, I, I really think it's a great work and just, you know, trying to get get more even analysis out there. All 
Unmute, Mr. William. Sorry. Um, I'm William Reeves. I'm the author of a book called Odin's Wife, Mother Earth and Germanic Mythology. I also have translated works by Victor Rydberg, including Our Father's God Saga. And uh, hopefully this year, I'll be releasing another book called Towards the Evidence, which is Rydberg's first attempt to explain his um, interpretation of Norse mythology, and it predates his work on um, investigations into Germanic mythology by about a year. So that should be, it's kind of a synopsis of his, his theory that is fully fleshed out in two volumes, investigations into Germanic mythology. So I hope that will serve as a way for people to get into um, the epic method without actually having to read and try to decipher Rydberg's complete works because they, they're pretty complex. They can't be. So I'm hoping to make it uh, easier for people to access. Excellent. Mr. Mr. William also runs what's what your site called Germanic mythology.com, right? Yeah. I, I call it a resource resource for researchers and it's got a lot of um, trans. I, <laughs> I forget, I forget what it's called now. Uh, translations, scholarship, text translations and scholarship. That's it. So it's uh, just a great resource. If you want anything about old Norse mythology, it's got dictionaries, it's got original texts, links to manuscripts, translations, you know, whatever I could find that's in the public domain. So. Yeah. Excellent website. People would use it for a long, long time, a lot of years. And, uh, you know, speaking of a lot of years, Mr. Mark's been at this for a lot of years, provide resources with the Drona Society. But what we're going to talk about today is, yeah, I'm just going to let Mark take it away. I'm just going to sit back and hang out and listen. And Mark, uh, take us away. What are we talking about today? And, uh, yeah, take us away. Okay. So I wanted to get everybody together. We've been talking for a few weeks here and wanted to try to organize something because I did a talk at a, at a, uh, a forum recently. And we were talking about Loki and we're looking at like Loki as a as a figure. What how is his character represented in the lore? What is he? How does he uh, configure with what we're looking at in the actual source material? Um, we try to filter it away from interpretations because there's so many just interpretations out there. There's just people who, you know, try to get there and they're like, OK, well, I'm going to represent Loki from a nature school representation or a biblical school representation or something that you know, allows people to just make the sources into whatever they want it to be, right? And so what we're here to do is talk about the actual source material. Now, what I'm doing, you know, right now is I'm working on a book on law. It's going to be called Avon Luger because we did the Avon Runer book one and book two. And the Avon Runer represents like the runes of earthly life. Like we believe that this was the doctrine, like sort of the orthodoxy the gods gave us that Heimdall brought to us. And they um, they taught us, you know, these these ways to live the faith. And so I couldn't think of any better title for the law because the law would have been included in that included in that. And Odin, I mean, Heimdall gave us those those laws and that culture and everything that made us who we are. And so we're going to put together the Avonluger to make it something that, uh, you know, that we can really understand what the law was and how did it work and what did it represent? And we have to we have to sort of delve into like a lot of propaganda. There's a lot of stuff out there about our faith that's just simply not true. And I start out by demonstrating that the uh, that the law, the, the, just the very idea of us being legal and us having morals and us having a structure of morals um, is something that we can find in sources. But Christians pass down the idea that it didn't exist, that we're all just savages or barbarians or we just did whatever we want to. And there wasn't a legal structure. And a lot of that started with the Bacchanalia. Um, the Bacchanalia became like this thing where it started out as a, a fertility festival, harvest festival. They had a very strict priesthood that was just women. And they were the only ones that were allowed to pray to Bacchus and represent the rites. And they, they sort of um, manifested it for the people. And then it was just like a twice a year festival, twice a year event. And then like a lot of rich degenerates got a hold of it and they made it into what they wanted it to be. And they turned it into where it was like there's a festival every month now and it's big orgies and we're drinking all the time and we're getting in fights and we're murdering people and we're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. The biggest argument against that being a tenet of, of polytheism is that the pagan Rome, Romans at the time banned that. They banned the practice. So it completely contradicts the narrative, but the Christians got a hold of this and said, this represents all of polytheism, right? 
that it's lawlessness. It's the idea of breaking away from the divine, breaking away from the true God and all this stuff, right? And so what I started doing is I started showing a history of polythe polytheist law, starting with the Hammurabi Code, going into Indo-European laws, Germanic law codes, you know, uh, European law codes, stuff like that. And then looking at what does law represent. And one thing that I started to notice unfold as I did this is I saw a lot of things that we see Loki do in the lore being banned in the laws, right? And so it really, really starts to unfold the character of Loki. And I truly believe that if you want to understand who Loki is, you have to understand him from a legal perspective. And so I put together this outline uh, that we could discuss. And, like, you know, we're going to start with uh, looking at Loki and the Eddas, um, the episodes that he, uh, he engages in, the things that he does, right? So that we can examine them one at a time and critique them specifically from what the sources are saying, rather than trying to create a fake interpretation like he's this, he's that, he's whatever, whatever I say he is. Let's look at what the sources say and then compare that to the laws. So I'll pass that on to Keith because we're going to start with Volusba and looking at uh, his uh, the word Vafuder, the concepts behind that, and how we can really start to look at these episodes. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, yeah, so as Mark said, um, so we're going to start by looking at the Eddas and where Loki appears in other relevant texts. So um, starting with Volusba, specifically the Hauk's book manuscript of Volusba. So um, Volusba, there's two manuscripts of this. The one that you're going to most often see in translations is from the Codex Regius uh, or, the, or the King's book. Um, but there's another complete uh, version of this poem in the house book. And there are some differences. So in the first stanza, um, it's kind of introducing the poem. There is one slight difference. So in the main version, in the in the Codex Regius version of this, um, the, the vulva starts out by saying, a hearing I bid of all holy kinds, greater and lesser sons of Heimdall, uh, you wish that I tell forth of Valfoder's um, Sorry, I lost this. I uh, wish that I tell forth of Valfather. Uh, Valfather, you wish that I well recount the old tales of men of those which I foremost remember. Now, this is different in the house book, where instead of saying uh, Val, Valfather, which is referring to Odin, it says Valfather, which means woe father. Um, so here it says, you wish that I tell forth of woe father's wile. Um, of the old losses of man. So here, this is interesting because in the one version, we have a clear reference to Odin, um, where the, the vulva is addressing Odin. It's sort of an introduction to the rest of her uh, site. But instead, in this version, she's saying, I'm going to talk about woe father's wile. So wile being trickery. Um, and this is particularly interesting because in the house book version of Wolaspa, um, the stanzas are oriented a bit differently, where it really stresses the role of, um, of this figure, Golveig, Hather, the, the witch in the Ironwood, who are all the same figure, this, this witch who gets burned by the gods three times and comes back. She's sort of Loki's counterpart. So it really stresses the, the negative roles, the machinations of the witch and of Loki in the bringing of Ragnarok. So this contrasts with the um, Codex Regius version, which is a little bit more broad. Um, it, it addresses a lot of other things. It includes more geographical references. So it's, it's a little bit less focused, whereas the house book version very distinctly focuses on the, the negative acts that bring about Ragnarok. So this really stresses to us that that Loki, you know, should be considered um, as low father. So that's kind of our introduction. Now, when you start to actually look at uh, where he appears in the rest of the Edda, uh, we see a number of episodes here. So the first one that we've got that we're going to take a look at um, is the cutting of Sieg's hair. So this shows up in Skald Skoppermal. Um, and it is sort of alluded to in Locusena, which is in the Poetic Edda. So in Skaldskapramal, we have an accounting. Um, it, it says that Loki cut off Sieg's hair 
Uh, Thor gets angry, obviously. The reason for this being is that cutting off the hair uh, is sort of a sign of adultery for a woman. You know, so whether or not she actually committed adultery, Loki marks her um, as being an adulteress. So he, he, you know, he, he shames her. And then this episode actually leads into the contest of the artists, which is that episode where we see um, the, the gods demanding that Loki get a suitable replacement for her hair crafted. And this is where then uh, we get the golden hair crafted for Sieve. And this is also where the other great treasures of the gods, including Mjolnir, Gungnir, um, uh, Freya's ship, uh, Steve Blafnir, etc., crafted. Does anybody want to add anything here? Yeah, I'd like to say real quick, and then I want to pass it on to William. But uh, in one of the laws, um, I believe this is the Borger thing law. I didn't write down the, the citation, but um, it says that it um, one of the things that is uh, that demands full atonement. It says it is also an insult that calls for a full atonement to accuse a woman of being a whore and to call her a whore if she is without guilt. So there's the first law that we see connects directly to something that Loki does. Right. And we see it, it is against the law in the Lord. Right. And we note that in those stories, we see, you know, Loki gets brought before the thing of the gods and they demand that he compensate for what he does. They make him go to the dwarves. He doesn't do it out of the kindness out of his heart. He's made to do it because that is what Old Norse law does. It demands a compensation. It doesn't allow you to try, try to do something out of your kindness. You have to do it. It's the law. It's like getting sentenced today to a, a jail time. Anyway, I'll pass it on. We, we only have so much time, so we want to try to get to everything. Okay. okay. Um, so I guess I'll keep going unless, William, you have something to add? Not, not to that specifically. Okay. So um, I'm actually going to, just because of this uh, this kind of segue, I'm going to talk about this, this competition of the artist. So um, when the gods then craft these treasures, or, or sorry, they have these treasures crafted, um, of course, as Mark said, he does not go about doing this until he's really forced to. Uh, and, and even in the course of doing this, of, of atoning for this crime, he has to get a bit of mischief in here. He makes a bet. Um, you know, he goes to the Dwarf Brother and Sindri, and he bets that they can, you know, make treasures better than the Sons of Aldi. So um, they then set about crafting Yolnir, uh, the Golden Boar, etc. So, um, and, and in the course of doing this, then he's worried he's going to lose the bet. So then he tries to sabotage their craft. So we see here that even when he's atoning, he's still kind of trying to, to cause trouble. Uh, and this episode then ends up spiraling and causing a bit of a rift with uh, the Sons of Vivaldi, the, the craftsman, um, which we then see in a later episode, um, House Long, where the gods kind of, they, they go to visit uh, Fiazzi to sort of try to, to make good on this rift to, to heal this up. And this then ends up leading to another thing and another thing and another thing. You see that the, the machinations of Loki, he just, he keeps, he keeps, uh, you know, sabotaging the gods and then he's forced to try to make up for it. But in the course of making up for it, he then sows the seeds for the next big episode that is going to cause further harm. So you can trace this chain of events all the way back and you can see his complicity in it. One so, thing I need to add about uh, specifically the, the contest of the artists or before we move on. One what thing you... I add right there, um, what's typically not seen, what we what we do is a little different because we, we have the epic method, is people don't typically see Theazi as being connected to that contest. The connection is, is that he's one of the sons of Vivaldi. So the contest is between the Sons of Vivaldi and the Dwarves, Brock and Sindri. Brock and Sindri, of course, make Thor's hammer and win the bet. But Vivaldi, sorry, um, uh, Biazzi is one of the Sons of Vivaldi, and he's very angry that he lost the contest because he gave gifts freely. And here he's being slighted and basically judged inferior when he didn't even know there was a contest. And one of the Kenyans in the lore um, gold is called Thiazi's thing skill, meaning his testimony before the thing. So his works had to speak for him. So in the epic method, we are able to make these connections where um, they're basically just seen as loose stories that are, have no connection whatsoever. But when you study the poetry, and Keith is excellent at this, his, his book Bold is, I highly recommend that. Um, you can see the connections between these 
myths is lost in Sorizetta because they're presented as loose fables and the, the poetry shows the connections between them. Yeah, I um, in the introduction to my to my book, I, I talk about the scaldic poetry and that that kenning that he mentioned, the Fiazi Stinskio, I do go into and I list a number of other variants, including um Evia Glus Malu, which uh, is is Evie's golden speech. Um, Evie is another one of the sons of Valdi, brother of Fiazi. Um, and there are numerous other examples. So you can really um, thoroughly tie via these cannings um, the Fiazi and his brothers to this event. So in either case, uh, I'm going to get to the next crime because this kind of then chains together. So because um, then, then I'll turn that over to Mark. So in, in uh, House Long, so we see it is the aftermath of this contest. Uh, Fiazzi is obviously very upset because, as William said, he he loses a bet. You know, his 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 goods are judged inferior when he didn't even know that it was a competition. Um, so the gods are going to visit Fiazzi, and uh, and they end up getting into an altercation with Fiazzi. But the interesting thing is here is that um, Fiazzi, when he kind of attacks them, it's it's kind of a funny. Uh, in interaction where there's a, a stick which like which he uh which loki i think wax the ozzy with and, and it ends up getting stuck and loki's stuck to it so then he ends up getting pulled away because the ozzy's in the form of an eagle um but it's interesting that the ozzy specifically targets loki just because he knows that loki is sort of the orchestrator of of this um you know of this this issue it's sort of this slight against him but the reason that I mention this is because this episode is then what leads into the kidnapping of Idu. So when when uh, Loki is sort of taken away by Fiazi, uh, Fiazi says, "I'm not going to let you go unless you kidnap Idu from the gods." Uh, so then, what do you know? Loki goes and kidnaps Idu. And the thing that I want to mention here before just turning it over is that. Um, so this this appears, I believe, in Stald Scopper Mall. But so Loki kidnaps Ethan, and then he doesn't tell the gods about it. He doesn't say, "Hey, I was forced to kidnap Ethan." He just lets it slide. She's gone, and then eventually, eventually, the gods notice. Oh, she's gone, and oh, the last time we saw her, she was walking out into the woods with Loki. So again, he does not do anything to try to fix his mistakes until. They basically round him up, string him up, and they force him to atone for his crimes. So, Mark, what do you want to add to this? Yeah, so I would add to that, you know, first off, we have Loki cavorting with the enemy, right? Uh, you have a Jotun that is uh, wanting to steal not just Eden, but also Eden's apples, which is an important technology to the gods. We see, like, there's a popular uh, uh, passage in Tacitus's Germania, tw chapter 12, where it says, uh, before the General Assembly, likewise, criminals may be charged and tried for their lives. The penalties varied with the crime. Traitors and renegades are hung on a tree, right? Then you have in the Grey Goose Laws, the Gragas 160, it says, if a man abducts another man's betrothed, then full outlawry is the penalty for all who have a part in it at the suit of her legal administrator and also at the suit of her betrothed. And we got to remember that Bragi and Ivan are married, right? And so like you're taking somebody's wife you're taking you're stealing someone away from the gods and you're stealing someone's bride and so like that it's like just crime after crime after crime and we see this this these things that are happening a lot of when people are looking at loki and they're misinterpreting it it's because they think of things like in terms of modern law right we're like oh if he was a criminal he'd be going to jail well they didn't have jail back then you know people were outlawed they were cast away they were pushed out of the society out of the community or they were forced to compensate or they were the laws, executed or they were executed right and the laws are very clear on this and so like that's why i say over and over again and as we go into this you're going to see this gets deeper and deeper and deeper until we see that this this story culminates in loki being represented as one of the greatest criminals of the entire lore yeah so yeah, and I, and I would just add that the only reason that they don't execute him earlier is because of that that blood brotherhood that they swore, um, because they take it so seriously that despite all of these crimes, which in normal cases would merit execution or at the least banishment, um, he is allowed to atone and stay. Right. And the, and the one thing I would like to throw out there is that one thing a lot of New Agers do is they try to throw 
you know, Odin under the bus with that. They try to say, well, Odin did this and Odin did that, blah, 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 blah. And I've been looking at that as well. I've been looking at the, the, the studies on that, right? And the first thing I did was I tried to understand what the concept of a foreigner was, right? And when I looked in all the law codes, they have the concept of a foreigner, but the foreigner, the person who's only recognized at all within the law is a person who speaks Norse. Everybody else isn't even in the law. They're not even a part of it. And then when you just like look at Roman law and Greek law and stuff like that, things that they had because they were a little bit you know, more in depth with their laws, you can see that like they recognize foreigners as just having no rights at all. And, that, and that's in most societies today even. I mean, they have international law and stuff like that now. And that's mainly because, you know, after World War One, we just there was so much like insanity and death and from the trench wars and stuff like that. Everybody came together. It was like, OK, we got to create this so we don't just like start just wasting each other with anthrax and stuff, you know. But before that, there was no recognition of your rights as a foreigner. So when Odin goes into enemy territory, right, and you have to remember that Odin primarily when you're looking in the historic sources, such as Adam and Bremen and other sources, um, Inglinga Saga and all that. You see that Odin is the god of victory, and that is his role. He is a god of war and a god of victory. So when he's going into enemy territory and doing these things, it's because they are the enemy. They are trying to destroy the creation. They're trying to destroy Midgard. They're trying to destroy humanity. They want to rob the sun. They want to rape Freya. They want to do all of these horrible things, and he knows this, and he goes and faces them and uses his wits and his cunning in order to defeat them. And in ancient times, this was a very important thing. We can see a ver the exact same model in Greece, right? When you look at the difference between the cults of a uh, Athena and that of Ares, right? Because Ares was sort of just kind of considered, you know, war personified. He was just like the representative of the chaos of conflict and battle. And they actually have like uh, later paintings and drawings and stuff where they were showing, you know, Aphrodite trying to keep him at bay, trying to keep him calm and happy and, and, and you know, and, and settled down. Whereas Athena was the goddess of strategy. She was the goddess of generals, of, of understanding strategy and how to use your mind and your brain to win. And so that's why Odin and Athena have a lot of parallels in that regard. And then Odin, you know, he brings the Svinvilkja, which is the, the wedge-shaped formation, and teaches people Tavl and all of these different things. And that's like his, his thing. Like you learn how to use strategy and intelligence in war and that is something that's magical and powerful. And that's what he's doing to these Jotuns. I wanted to chime in real quick. A lot of this comes from uh, modern and uh, what we would call liberal presuppositions, like liberal priors. Yeah. This presupposition that all law, all morality is universal, whereas in the ancient world, the overwhelming majority of people across the world had what would we now call um, like dual morality. Right. right. Morality only really applied morality and law only really applied to your in group. And then right. people outside of that, it didn't apply. So that's why they had such uh, strict law. There's like a lot of like, you'll hear unis say this. Like unis will say, oh, well, you know, this group, the Germanics, they went and they pillaged and raided and this and that. And blah, blah, blah. So therefore, there are no rules. That's not how it works. Right. That's not how it ever worked in any society. And there are many cultures today that are walking around that still have this. And people point out, oh, well, look what it says in their books, that they're allowed to do X, Y, Z to outsiders, but they have laws for themselves. Yeah, that's how everybody used to be, that yep. you had laws and you had you had uh, ethics and you had morality that only applied to your, your tribe, your in-group. And for those outside, it didn't apply. So, you know, you know, you... you you may think you listening may think that that's not right, but that is your modern priors. That is your your internalized uh, modernism, your modern worldview. That's not an, that's not a focused worldview. That's not an ancient worldview. An ancient worldview is this stuff only applies to your in group and everybody else. You know, you know, whatever. You know what Bye -bye. I mean. <laughs> that's why you see like in the modern world you see so many like lunatics that are like well i'm going to go off into this you know crazy third world country and present my liberal values to them and then the next day you see them you know their heads cut off and they're on the news and they've you know just been slaughtered by this tribe and they're like man that didn't work out too well did it <laughs> <laughs> well yo uh, real quick we got a super chat and then i want to run i want to run a couple of quick ads and then we're going to get right back to it okay so our boy kyle davis our our brother you know 
Brother Kyle. Kyle. Brother Kyle says, hail to you and uh, hail to you all. And thank you for taking time to offer all of us educational information. The heathen community needs this more than anything for five bucks. Thank you so much, Mr. Kyle. That is going to go right into the bog coffers. So we may continue our march. And then real, real quick, I want to run a couple quick ads and then we're going to get right back to it here. So uh, we're going to uh, do a couple short little videos to promo some books. Who don't love books? Here we go. Let me actually let me find it. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Both of those books are heathen written. So we got, uh, speaking of heathens, we got the Molybdus Articulate, a really great Lovecraftian cosmic horror novella from my kinsman, guy actually in my clan, Mr. Shane Hawks. Excellent book. It's actually a book. It's the only book we've ever put out that people emailed me and told me they couldn't finish it because it was so scary. Nice. It is a really disturbing book. It's it's really, you. so you like spooky cosmic horror, Lovecraft stuff, that's for you. And also, if you like cyberpunk stuff, Spire by the great A. Cuthbertson, guys, you can't beat it. It's all in and around 10 bucks still over on thebizarchives.com. Go get yourself a copy. Support, support heathen literature, heathen writers, right? So sp speaking of heathen writers, let's get right back to it. All right. So um, actually, from our previous discussion about in-group and out-group morality, uh, that actually leads really nicely into another example of Loki's deeds. Uh, the story in Gibble Beginning about the building of the wall around Asgard. Um, so in this story, uh, the gods, they they make a deal with this builder who shows up. He's going to build the wall. Um, and if he can do it, I think it's in just a couple of days or something that they owe him a bride. So in either case, um, the interesting thing in this story, and I'm just going to read this, is uh so they're they're kind of trying to get their way out of this deal but they do still have to adhere to it um uh, because they they made an agreement they are bound however um at the end here we've got this line that says uh when the right saw so when the builder saw that the work could not be brought to an end that he couldn't do it in time he fell into yolton's fury so into a giant's fury now that the asir saw surely that the yolton had come hither um, they did not regard their oath reverently. So once they knew that uh, that this builder was a Yolton, that he was not um, part of their group, that he was in fact part of the out group, suddenly the rules changed. They did not have to adhere to this agreement and Thor goes out and kills the builder. Um, so this is an example of prior to this point when they did not know that he was a Yolton, they had to adhere to an agreement, even though they didn't like the agreement, even though the agreement was not in their favor, ultimately in the end, they were going to lose pretty badly. Um, they had to adhere to it until they knew that he was in fact a Yolton. Then he transitioned from being in group to out group, and then they could slay him without any kind of, um, you know, stain upon their honor for breaking an agreement because agreements cannot be considered valid necessarily with an out group. Um, so that's kind of our, our segue here. But within this story, 
Um, this is where we see uh, Loki again, you know, kind of playing playing his role um, at the behest of the gods. But he he shifts into the form of a mayor and he mates with the horse Svadalfari um, and is impregnated by it, giving birth to Slaithi. Um So here he is he's playing the female role. So we have both uh, you know changing genders. So you know it's kind of really emasculating. Um, and he is also having sex with a horse, so it's bestiality. So we, uh -oh. we you know, just kind of sexual perversion going on all over here. Right. Both of which are mentioned in the laws and, and banned. You know, I don't have the exact citation on that one, but I do know uh, that that is a thing, you know, because they have the, the laws about atonement is basically um, the law that I cited earlier about women and uh, claiming that they're whores and stuff like that. That same law. Let's see. Yeah, um, if you if you say uh, the second is when he says that a man has been used as a woman, right? Like that's a that's a if you say that about somebody that calls for atonement, right? Yeah. And so like you know these are things that that we see in these law codes and they're they're directly. I mean these people knew this. The people who were writing the stories or you know divinely inspired write stories and all this stuff they knew these laws, you know because like the one thing that I've I've done. Is I've traced um, all the way back to the Lombard laws in 666, you know, um, all the way up into the you know 12, 1300s. Um, you see, like the the codes are the same. It's it's so identical. Like Weregild is in all of them. They all have a section where they list body parts, and there's like numerical values to those body parts. They have a lot of similarities with compensations and atonements. I mean, they knew these laws. They, there's no doubt about it. There's absolutely no doubt that the people who were printing the pen to paper and knew who Loki was, they knew these laws and lived under them. Um, I can say some things here. Um, people tend to think of Loki as a trickster, and I, I know that's maybe one thing we're going to come to, but um, they tend to focus on the good things Loki accomplishes. Like he he achieved, he. Um, brings the horse Svadalfar, I'm sorry, the horse Schleppner for Odin back from that episode with the builder of the wall. Or he, um, in that contest of the artist, he gets Thor's hammer plus a number of other gifts for the gods. And these are indispensable gifts, there's no question. But what people don't see, because we don't, they don't have that epic connection between the myths, they don't see in the, in the contest of the artist what Loki has done is he's created animosity between the two groups of smiths that produced freely for the gods up to that point. And then he also creates an enemy of one of the main smiths, um, Voland, Thiazi. And Thiazi ultimately creates a weapon greater than Mjolnir that ultimately ends up as the sword that Surt uses to destroy the entire world. So without these epic connections, you can't really see um, Loki's true character. So he's seen as a trickster, someone who goes against the social norms. Um, and then he's connected to this universal... Um, um, trickster archetype, which was formed um, from Native American and um, African stories um, of Coyote, the Native American Coyote, and there's another character called Raven in one of the tribes, and then um, I think it's Anasi, the spider. Anasi. Yeah, yeah, Anasi, the spider in African traditions. So that that archetype of the trickster um, predates before Loki was even associated with it. And then in the 1800s, Loki was considered a fire being. And so he was starting to be compared to these. Um, there was um, one specific one. Um, it was a, a Algonquin uh, fire demon called Lox that Loki was being compared to. And then around the turn of the century, um, he started to be actively compared to this trickster figure. But scholars recognize that um, um, Jan de Vries is the one who first really makes the the argument that loki is the trickster figure and there's more to it than that but without those connections between the myths you can't see um, what mark is talking about where loki really is breaking the law here he's not just a trickster he's not just doing these things and they're comical and in some aspects they are and he does on occasion bring back good things from it but there is a real sense of destruction here that leads ultimately to Ragnarok. So it's very important to see the connections between those myths. And that's that's what the popular mythology books are missing. And that's why the epic method is so different is we do see the connections, we make the connections, and then we can actually 
make those deeper interpretations that the, the popular scholars just can't make because their method is different. Their method doesn't allow it. So, right. Right. Oh, and we got a super chat from Skunkabilly77 for $9.99. Thank you so much, Skunkabilly. Thank, Thank you. you guys for this panel. Unfortunately, too many embrace chaos and Lokiism. Lokiism. <laughs> Hail all y'all. Fire. Thank you so much, Skunkabilly. Uh, hails and blessings to you. I just wanted to chime. I think it's hilarious, right? There's um, out there, there are uni nithings, right, that like to use uh, use this example of Loki and his, his his treachery and his deviancy to justify theirs, right? Uh, Loki did X, Y, Z, so therefore I could be a, you know, demi, demi-gender, polyamorous, furry, you know, dragon kin or whatever these like, kind of creature they like to fantasize themselves to be, right? right? It's just hilarious to me that you guys are pointing it out and it says right in there, like, these things were against the law to behave in such a manner with this this kind of stuff. So it's like it's it's is so clear how how um, how abominable and dishonest, purposely dishonest they are with their so-called interpretations. I'll just, it's it's really based in ignorance of the myths. I, I agree with everything you just said, but um, uh, they cannot make the connections and see these things because the the books just don't don't make the connections for us. So right. um, there's so much I can say on this. I just um, <laughs> I kind of lost my train of thought there, but uh, I'll give it over to you guys. But there, there's I really in preparation for this, I really focused on the connections between the myths um, specifically. Um, one thing I will say. Um, Loki is bound. We see that. And people, the, the Lokians that you're speaking of, tend not to recognize that. Um, Loki is bound right now. He's already bound. Um, those myths happened in the past. It makes that very clear. So they like to say that Loki is one of the gods and that Odin had made this oath to, to um, Loki not to drink, not to drink unless, Lo unless they were both together. Well, Loki broke that oath as soon as in the same poem where he admits that he killed Balder. So those things are just dismissed by these people who embrace Loki for the reasons that you describe. There is much more to the story. And without those epic connections, you can't make those judgments. So what they like to say is that um, Locusina is just a Christian creation. It's an attack on the gods. I've heard this numerous times. Um, and that it's 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 like Christians creating this to denigrate the gods, and that's that's not there, there's there's nothing Christian in the poem Locus in it. It's very deep. So, right. um, and it does it illustrates the law in multiple ways. Exactly what Mark is saying. So yeah, I don't know how you could look at a, a figure who ended up like chained up in the underworld with his mouth sewn shut and be like, oh, I want to be like that guy. It just makes no sense to me. It's they like don't believe it. They they, believe they it just, that's the end of the, that's the at, that's what it is at the end of the day. They just don't actually believe this. So when I debate these people, this is what I press them on. I say, you guys are just impious. You don't actually believe this. This is a game. If you did actually believe this, you would fear that type of that type of end, right? That type of doom, right? It's like the same thing as people that say. Um, and a lot of it is, is Lucifer, Luciferian entryism, satanic entryism, where they like to bring up Prometheus, right? I use this example a lot about, of the, the story of uh, Prometheus and Epimetheus, right? Prometheus goes and defies the gods and gives the fire to humanity. And New Agers like to paint him as this type of this liberator, right? Oh, he gave the gift to humanity and the big bad you know, uh, deities of the Olympians are tried to hold us down. It's which is complete, just like liberation philosophy garbage. But uh, look at where Prometheus ended up chained to a rock with his guts getting ripped out by a bird every single day over and over again till the end of time. Damnation of the of the highest order, the most horrible and sufferable say, fate. Right? Why would you want to do that? You know, just I don't know about you guys, but that don't. You know, I'd rather be out here grilling, drinking beer, or something like that. Well, there's one thing I would say is like, you know, back in the 90s, and it's not really something you see anymore, but back in the 90s, there was a sort of movement 
of uh, white Indians, Native Americans, people who are going around trying to join all these tribes. And the Native Americans tried to embrace them and be nice to them and all that stuff because they're kind, good people and all that stuff. And like these people would go to their gatherings or powwows and they would leave trash everywhere and they'd desecrate their sacred sites and they would just, you know, piss all over everything that they touched. And they had no respect for the traditions, no respect for anything. And that's what these people are like. We, you can't, definitely can't expect them to uh, appreciate this because they see everybody who follows it. That's not them as a Nazi or some kind of horrible hate monger or something like that, you know. And that like this, the same thing happened in, uh, and I, I've told this story before is uh, in Hawaii, you know, they have all these sacred shrines all over there for the native Hawaiians and new agers would come up there and leave beer bottles at it. And they were asking them to please stop doing that, that that's not an offering to our gods. That's not how this works. Please stop. And they don't, they're just like, no, we don't care. We'll do what we want. You know? And it's like, that's the thing. Um, Anyway, I'd like to move because I know we're, we're moving, yeah. pushing time here. You know, um, I'd actually like to let me get one question because there's a hot topic right now. We're kind of on it, and okay. William just kind of like touched on it. He said about <laughs> these things in in the Edda have already happened, right? Right now, there's a debate in the community about, I guess, what you could say. Some people are being called literalists, right, to take the the Edda literally. And then there are the, the other side, or I guess you could say uh, allegorists or something like that. Who knows? But there's this kind of this debate of whether the, the, the myths should be um, interpreted literally or, um, I guess, allegorically or something like that. So, uh, for, but for us to, to accept that these things have happened in the past, it sort of implies a literalist interpretation. Now, Mark, I know you have a little bit more nuanced take on this. Could you, could you guys... Just give me a quick uh, little bit of what you think about this. Well, well I'll start. I, I think that the stories definitely should be taken at, at, you know, as true, right? But I also believe that these stories are written by poets and scalds, and they write in code, you know. And it's a, it's an important to understand that code. The code is part of the spirituality, like deciphering this and being inspired by Odin to understand what is being said here. That is the spirituality. That's what they were trying to convey. It's why scalds were so important. You know, uh, William, I've talked this a, a, a thousand times talking about the this sort of aha moment when a skull is sitting there reading you a piece of poetry and you're like, oh, I, I get what's happening here. I understand this. And it takes a background and an understanding and knowledge of this in order for these things to compute. So it's kind of it's kind of both for me. It's like, you know, it's 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 a truth, but it's a coded truth. I can yeah, I, I would agree. Um, you know, I, I think that there is truth there. Um, you know, I think that understanding the story uh, is important, but, you know, depending on how you want to interpret it, like, was there literally, um, like, was Odin literally on Earth with a big beard and he literally had one eye ripped out, you know, or or is the eye that's missing that he had to sacrifice, is that representative of, you know, the sacrifice itself or greater knowledge and wisdom, you know, yeah, yeah. So there's there's a lot of ways that you can interpret it. I I'm never quite settled. I think I I think it both ways a little bit. Um, but uh, you know, but the nice thing about the analysis that we do here and making it available to people is that ultimately we're just trying to reconstruct the lore and, and make it available to people. So the way that you interpret it, if you take it as the literal truth, or if you want to. Um, you know, see it a little bit more from an allegorical fashion, that's up to you, um, you know, and you can still do that. Uh, there is a literal story within the myths. The, the poems speak of stories. They're, they're, they typically don't tell stories. A lot of times they're just conversations between two people or a quick synopsis of events. There's a whole history as a backdrop. And that's really the way to look at it. Like any religion, we have the history of, sorry, the creation of the world, the creation of man, the history of the early generations, how they were, how the gods interacted with the early generations of man. And then in real life, people connected themselves to the gods. They were either descendants of, like le tribal leaders were descendants of, say, Odin and Skathi. And, um, there were heroic myths, and these hero these heroes were considered to be ancestors in many respects. Um, Tacitus tells us that about that all the Germanic tribes were descended from three sons of Manus. We find that exact pattern with half Dan and his sons in the epic. So, in a real way, the myths I believe were considered to be real history, 
but when you read those poems, they're full of symbolism and layered, um, just layers of meaning. Sometimes one verse can have, have two or three different things. When when Keith was doing his translation of Wallace Bow, we had an opportunity to talk about um, specific verses and I saw things in there through Keith's interpretation that I hadn't seen before and both interpretations were valid in regard to the, um, the mythic epic. So the poems are riddles and the, the culture highly valued um, riddles and figuring out things. Um, that's that's the whole concept behind Skaldic poetry. You have these very complex kinnings and allusions. Um, an Icelander once said that their language paints pictures, and that's what it really does. So you have to figure out what that picture means, and it can have multiple layers of meaning. But behind all of these these references, there is a chronological epic history of the world and the people in it and their interactions with the gods behind it. And so, yes, it's literal in that sense. And Ragnarok is a future event, but Loki's binding is specifically something that happened in the past. And in fact, in Snorri's version, it's used to explain why earthquakes happen. It's Loki mm -hmm. riding in pain when, uh, when the basin of, of uh, snake venom is full and, and Sigyn has to take it away. So, so let me ask you guys this. Do you think that, say, we went into the underworld where Loki is bound or, or said to be bound, would we see him there? Yeah. In Saxo Book 8, there's an actual instance of that. A group of travelers sails north beyond the sun and the moon. They travel into complete darkness, and they enter caves down into the underworld. They see the scene that is described in Volispa around 37 about the hall on the Nostrands, and they enter a cave where they see a being called Utgard Locus, which is Loki bound. He's Loki of the Outguard, and it's not the same Utgard Loki that Thor encounters later. That's a different character. But yeah. so we actually see in a history of Denmark uh, an adventure and his crew going down and finding Loki in the underworld. So I believe that the people saw it as an authentic, you know, it is a real thing. And um, in Adam of Bremen, too, there's references that that line up with the mythology and they're presented as though they're they're real events. So yeah, you know, there's also an image of this that appears. Um, on the Gosforth cross, um, you can look it up, or uh, I think, yeah, if you want to look at it, but it but it shows Loki bound, um, or you know you can determine that it's Loki because it's a figure bound on the ground, and there's a woman, um, you know, sitting above him, uh, you know, holding uh, a, a horn to or a bowl to catch the venom that's dripping down on. Right. So so you know, this this story, this this fate of his is confirmed. You know, in right. sources. I think a lot of folks are are a little bit nervous to take the step to say, yes, I actually literally believe this. Right. It, you know, I know it took me in my the development of my faith to, to get to that point and to admit that like publicly to like say it out loud that I believe that that happened. I right? believe. Yeah, I believe. I, I believe I believe yeah. that that uh, the Havel Mall in some shape or way was written by Odin. I think Odin writ, wrote that somehow, right? Uh, whether it was, you know, somebody that was inspired by him or, or whether he was like in human form and he wrote that, I think the gods literally came to earth in human form and, and sired us. And uh, some of the stuff, like, for example, recently I had a, a fellow ask me, well, how is it that you believe in, in the events that are described in Voluspa? Like the, the you know the great cosmic cow, you know, Emir being you know ripped apart, and the whole all of reality being built from his his body parts, which is you know pretty pretty gruesome and also kind of kind of awesome. But it, how did he said he asked how do how do I come to terms with that? How do I explain that? Because that sounds you know it sounds very mythic. And I said this is how I describe it, and this is going to sound kind of strange to some folks maybe, but. Um, uh, coming to, like, to understand these descriptions, I I have a better job after I really, really dug into reading H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft gave me a tool to interpret it, interpret um, the myth, not not you know, on purpose, but by reading his stories. And uh, the way that I interpret it, the way that I see it is those things actually happened. However, what is written in in the Edda is written so that human beings can understand it. 
Think about it like this. If you're at the beginning of all things before things have thingness, how are you going to be able to uh, comprehend what you are seeing? Right. How is it that the things that are of primordial form before forms had form? How are you going to be able to comprehend this? If you even looked upon this, it would probably break your psyche because the way that it works is that you can only perceive and understand things based on previous nodes of of stimulus and experience. So you only know something based on referencing it to something you have seen before, something that exists in your reality. Right. If you go into a place or a time or a dimension, whatever you want to call it, before your reality even existed and came into being, how are you going to describe that? It's indescribable. So whoever saw this or whoever inspired, maybe whoever what gave the vision to the seeress that wrote down uh, Voluspo was just gave it to her in words that, that he or they knew what the seeress would understand. Right. Because probably what happened can't even be put into language, probably can't even be understood by the human mind. So that's how I interpret it. Well, if you want to look at it in more of a, a modern sense, right, something that kind of puts it in perspective for people is imagine you're an ancient man before modern science and you come into a cave and you see a 20 foot long femur bone. You know, you're like, what is this? How do I wrap my mind around this? Like, what is this thing? You know, but we see it. That's dinosaurs. Like, that's a thing that, you know, with people have studied and they put them together and all this stuff. And they said, this is what it looks like back together. But they didn't have that. So it's like yeah. wrapping your mind around the form of it, right? Wrapping your mind around this grand design of creation of all these things that happen. You know, it's, it's like, like yeah, it's like, like they say showing a light switch to a caveman. Now right. imagine that many, many, many magnitudes greater, like yeah. unfathomably greater. Well, if you're, uh, you're Arthur or C. Clark, uh, you know, think about any any technology sufficiently advanced is going to appear like magic. So, right. any I was, was going to say something very similar. The, the mythology is the ancient understanding of the world. It's that there's science, if we look at it that way. We have a yeah. different understanding of science today. But those stories, to best understand them, you have to put yourself in the mindset of that time. So when I study the myths, I'm not trying to overlay modern science onto it and trying to figure out, you know, what, what it means. I think that's where people go wrong. You just have to compartmentalize. You know, we live in a modern world, with modern science and our modern understanding. Those ancient people didn't have that. So if you want to understand the truths in their religious documents, you have to literally put yourself in that mindset. You look up and you see, um, you know, you're, you're inside of a giant skull. That's the sky. The sun and the moon are cars that are driving across the sky. If you can, I call it thinking mythically. When you think mythically and you read the poetic Edda and you understand that it's not a story, it's it's these word pictures alluding to stories that the population had to have known well because they're so obscure and elusive. For anyone to understand it, there would have to be a background story. And scholars say that. Um, the problem is, is that people go to Snorri Zeta and think that that is the explanation when Snorri was a Christian writing more than 200 years after the conversion, and he's using those same poems, it clearly doesn't understand the way the old Hebrews did. Uh, multiple, multiple examples demonstrate that. So um, you just have to put yourself in the mindset of the ancient people to understand the poems. Yeah. Well, I have a, I have a question I wanted to ask William, because um, I always forget the poem. I know it's one of the, probably one of the, like one of the Helgi poems, but what's the one where the the two guys are like insulting each other and they're basically calling each other Gulveg and, and Loki and it's Helgi Vane one. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. So, so like in looking at that, right. I, I wanted, I was thinking about that cause it's, it's a really great like reference to Loki and actually can show you um, some of the episodes and connections that you can see there. Right. Because there are two men there. They're insulting. Was it Sinfjotli and uh, Goodman. And, Goodman. Yeah. And Goodman, right? And they're sitting there going back and forth, and they're saying, "Well, you gave birth to monsters, and you did this, that, and the other, right?" Yeah. So I, I, this law that I've cited a couple of times, and I looked it up, it's the Gula thing law, right? It's one ninety six. Okay, um, I want to read this to you guys, right? And then I want you to tell me that the guy who was who understood Loki, the guys who were writing poems about Loki and all this stuff, that they did not know this law, right? It says these are the kinds of insulting remarks that call for full atonement. The first is when a man says of another that he has given birth to a child. The second is when he says that a man has been used as a woman. 
The third is when he likens, likens him to a mare or calls him a slut or a whore or likens him to any kind of a female beast. For these remarks, he shall pay the man full atonement. But the man may also seek satisfaction in blood and outlawry for the things that have been now enumerated if he has asked witnesses to take note of them. Men may repent of their utterances and withdraw them if they wish and acknowledge that they know nothing worse about the man than about any good man. If an insult that calls for full atonement for a man to call a free man a thrall or a monster or a malefactor, it is also an insult that it calls for a full atonement to accuse a woman of being a whore and to call her a whore if she is without guilt. That's almost like the entire story of, of Loki in one law. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's a bad example. He represents <laughs> not to. Yeah. <laughs> right. he's, punished. he's actually punished for it. I mean, he's, he's you know, chained in hell. Right. So, right. And, 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 that, and yeah. that's what I'm saying is that, like, all of these things that we see, because it, that's the most obvious example. Like, this is when he gets punished, you know. And um, and, and I, I cited in my talk, I was talking about the book, The Trial of Loki, right, um, by Alan Watts, I think his name. And it goes into Loki Sin, and it basically shows how that's a trial. And Loki is there, and he's basically being tricked and fooled into confessing all of his crimes, right? But when we see in the sources, in several of the sources, when he commits these crimes, they say that they bring him before a thing, right? And it specifically uses the word a thing, which is a legal assembly. He's being brought before a thing of the gods and they're making him compensate. It's basically saying like you're going to do community service or you got to go to jail for a little while or whatever. It's it, trying to put in that modern perspective. This is what they are doing to him. And when you see these same exact actions in the law that call for blood atonement or outlawry or just atonement, then you're seeing that these crimes are a thing and they were against the law. Yeah. In those, exam in those examples you gave, Loki wiggles out of it through clever language. So right. I'm sure in real life, people, I mean, we know people do that. They go to court, right. they go to the thing, and they're able to escape by telling lies or giving clever excuses. Loki does all that. Yeah. Ultimately, the All Saga has that, has examples of that. Yeah. In, Procedural in, errors is how yeah. they are. <laughs> yeah. Brand new um, All Saga. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, and, and actually, just to kind of return to the topic, um, well, but to continue on this. You, you see laws even mentioned in the Eddie poetry. Um, I mean, obviously the law codes are much more thorough, but even in Volispa, um, when it's talking about the underworld, there's there's this passage that I would just like to read. So so it's it's right after they talk about um, where Loki is bound and uh, and the, the Sierra says, she saw there to wade the heavy currents, perjured men, so men who perjure themselves, and uh, murderers and that one who beguiles another's wife. So here we have three things that are listed. So uh, perjurers, murderers, and seducers, basically. And Loki has done all three of these things. Um, he has lied many times. And I would say also add that in Bregin's Mall, um, uh, there's a line where Anvari says that lying men receive a, uh, a terrible requital having to wade in the river Vagdilmir um, so again, we have this idea that lying is a is a uh, a crime, it's punishable in the afterlife. And then he also um, murders, whether directly or uh, indirectly, you know, via masterminding Baldur's death. Uh, and then and then the seduction of women. Um, he certainly brags to have done so many times in Locusana, uh, as well as um, in Harvard's Leol. He talks about you know seducing all of these women. So. So it's interesting that in Volispa you have these three things mentioned as being crimes that cause men to be wading in this horrible river of of acid and you know and swords. And this stanza is put right juxtaposed to the one of where we see Loki bound in the underworld. So it's literally saying, here are the things that can get you into the underworld, and then there's Loki in the underworld, and he's done all of them. Right. Let me let me just add to that very quickly. I know we're running out of time. In Locus Center, those three things are happen multiple times. Loki's responsible for three murders in that poem. He kills the servant on the way in, he admits to Baldur's murder, and then Theazi's murder. Um, he breaks the oath with Odin, the blood oath, when he admits to killing Baldur. He's now killed a kinsman, based. He's, he's If he's a brother of Odin, he's killed Odin's son. And then not only one, but two, because he also is responsible for Hother's death. And then um, beguiling the ear of another man's wife or a confidant is, I believe, is how that's usually translated in Volispa. Um, 
Haydn, Skadi, and Sif, he directly accuses of having been their lover. And then when Freya, when he says that you've had everyone in the hall, all, all the Aesir and the elves, she's the only one in the whole poem who calls him a liar. And it's right at the center of the poem. So we see that the whole poem is based around a lie. The whole poem revolves around a lie. So I think that that's exemplifying that passage in Bolispa that Keith brought out. And then if you continue on in Bolispa, you see that Loki um, steers the ship Nagelfar. Well, it launches from it launches from the uh, Nostrands, the, the beach of corpses. So Volispa is very tight and very well constructed, as is Locusina, when you understand the epic. And, right. and like I, I think it's brilliant that Mark is studying this from the point of law because that just emphasizes Loki's role because all of the things Loki does is outlined in the law. Loki is the bad example. He's the lawbreaker, and he ultimately he suffers the punishment um, here and in the afterlife that all um, people who do those things are, you know, are said to that should suffer, I guess, for, you know, I, according to the law. So, um, um, Loki, by being bound in Niflhel, he is he is it's it's death. It is a symbol of death. He's been bogged, in other words. So, and he goes to the hall of serpents are. So, I mean, <laughs> they, they're very happy. <laughs> oh, yeah. The only way that you see that is through the epic. If you don't understand the epic, Loki is just a trickster figure who is doing all these crazy things. And then you can dismiss, you know, the, uh, you can dismiss Locusin and you can dismiss his binding or consider it some future event. I mean, that's how people typically get around this. Well, there's there's even things like in some of those lesser things that we see, right? I, I found one of the laws in the Salic law, right? It mentions um, if anyone finds cattle or a horse or flocks or any kind in his crops, he shall not mutilate them, right? Loki mutilates Thor's goats, right? We see in Thrymskvida when he convinces Thor to cross dress and, and all that stuff, right? Now this is a this is a comedy that gets played out in folk songs later on, but in the poems, uh, Thor specifically says, "I don't want the gods to see me as Ardur." Right, which is the same word as ergi. He does that. I don't want the gods to see me as a homosexual or a pervert or a freak, you know, basically. And he's that's sort of that, that term is used in the law frequently. And it's it's said that it's banned, that you or it's something that you don't want to be, right? And then referring to back to the um Loki as, uh, coming back as Ragnarok, um, there was another law from the Gula thing if a man sails forth as an enemy and returns to harry the land. Or those who are in the king's peace, natives or men of alien birth, he has forfeited land, his land and all of his movables, right? So he's basically just outlawed. He's, you know, so here's Loki doing the things in the law. And, and it's like I said, these, these people knew these laws. They lived under them, right? The, so if you go off into a land and you're a traitor and you're working with the enemy and then you come back to harry the land and destroy the king's peace, that's another law you've just violated. Literally everything that he does, there is a law for it. That he is breaking and these people were showing you this clearly and eventually it gets to a point where there's just so much evidence and so many things that you can present that the lokians have no arguments anymore you know and it's just going to be screaming and yelling and you're a bad person and you're a racist or any crap like that you know it's just it's not facts you're not building your your arguments on facts these are the facts these are the codes the law codes that these people live by and they co coincide precisely in every single little teeny, teeny tiny detail with what loki does period well mark what would you say to somebody that says uh you know well that was back then we're we have a different culture now or whatever they say well we, we don't i mean the fact is is doing these things you know like um i think that people today a lot of the people who would uh be against um or, or trying to say lokianism would um would be against you know mutilating animals and raping women and you know and causing murders and stuff like that and if it was just some dude that they didn't like they would be screaming at the top of the rooftops but because it's been presented as some sort of joke some sort of larpy joke or it's just some sort of fantasy that they're trying to live through, then it's not real to them, right? And that's the thing that I've always tried to tell people and convince people is that evil is real, right? It's not a game. It's not painting your face white with black you know, eyeliner and stuff like that and saying, look how evil I am. It's like raping little kids and chopping people's heads off and you know, laying waste to entire villages. That's evil, man. And that's what this represents. This is, we're talking about real evil stuff. 
sometimes people try to compare what we're saying, like, oh, you're just trying to make like an, an Odinic Satan or something like that. And it's like, dude, in, in Christianity, Satan actually has power. He does stuff. You know, he has like he rules an underworld. Loki's nothing. He's just a saboteur. He's a degenerate and a saboteur. And he's an example of who not to be. That's what he is. Yeah, and, and he's bound, as William said, you know, at this point. So he, he can't do anything at this point. Um, and and when, when we look at cross, like people who want to make cross-cultural references and stuff like that, the ideas of damned figures and, and, and figures that are that are uh, considered evil and bad, that exists all throughout polytheism. There, that's This is not something unique. That's the first thing I try to tell people when you're trying to understand this stuff is see if it's unique. If it's unique, then we can start making our, well, maybe Christian influence is involved here. We can look at that, right? But when it's not unique to polytheist culture, there's all kinds of concepts of damnation all over the world and different cultures have their different views on it and all this stuff. What's the problem is, is that so many people in the Western civilization live in these bubbles, these sort of academic bubbles, and they don't see the rest of the world or they live in this like sort of closed worldview and they think this is the only way to interpret things. And it's like, we have to go by what the evidence states. We have to go by what is looked at. Like, and a lot of like mainstream scholars are starting to fall in line with a lot of this stuff. You know, you see like, uh, Jackson Crawford makes arguments about the Yoltner being like the, the word is not giant. It's anti-God is what it is, you know, and like that's what it means. And he's, he's a, like one of the most loved linguists in the world, you know, and it's like this is what the reality of this is, you know, is that um, these these things you can't just create a fantasy and make it what you want it to be because you don't like it. Well, and, and Mark, I think you, you, you did a video a while back about uh, hard religion. Um, you know, versus soft religion, religion where where you need to sometimes change yourself to follow the rules. You need to sacrifice a little bit, and yep. this is a perfect example of it because because here we see people. You know, when you see Loki and you see all the things that he does, um, you know, you kind of and, and you see his fate. Uh, it might be a little bit concerning. So yeah, I think people like to to have that that Marvel view of Loki of, oh, he's a lovable trickster and, you know, and he might get into trouble, but he can get himself out again because then, you know, it's it's almost reassuring to think, well, you know, I, I guess really if I do some bad stuff, I'm not going to be stuck in the worst part of the underworld. Um, but here we are. We see the evidence where, where if you do those things, that's where you end up. So, you know, you need to, if, if, if you're doing any of those things or thinking about it, you need to not, or that's what's going to happen. Right. The universe, the, 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 in, the, in the faith, you know, fate always balances itself out. And that's the, the perspective of it. That's the idea. There's always a balance. Like when we look at the, the three wells, you know, there's the Mimer's well that's like the balance between the, 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 the south and the north, you know. And uh, so I, I, I definitely think that, you know, it has, you have to look at it from that perspective. So, do you guys have? Um, I know you guys had. Some, we had some itinerary coming into here. Is there? Uh, would you like to go a little bit longer? I said it hour twenty, hour half. Let's let's go to hour and a half. All right, I'm good. <laughs> well, I think that. Can um, I make a point? Yeah, go ahead. Um, you had you had um, mentioned earlier about um, you know about Odin specifically. There, there's Odin. What people like to say is that Odin broke the law. And there are instances where it says that Odin was an oath breaker, like in, in Havamal, but these are specific instances. And like you said, they're among the giants. And I think what it really illustrates when we have the epic, when we see Odin suffers consequences when he breaks the law. So when Odin, when Odin does things that are against the law, there are consequences for them. I, I won't get into detail, but the epic shows us that. And when he does these things, it's in the enemy context against, against um, Jotuns. So it kind of shows that nobody is above the law either, if, if that makes sense. So, Right. Even if those things are done for good purpose, mm -hmm. it doesn't excuse the action. Right. And it doesn't, it, that's, they use that to justify Loki's action. Well, Odin did it too. Yeah, but there's a punishment for that. And there's also, Loki also gets punished. And Odin doesn't end up in chains in the underworld. <laughs> Loki does. So, right. Well, also I, the thing I, is, is that in, in that concept, Odin is, you know, always provoked, whereas Loki just does it to do it. You know, Loki, Odin is trying to end, like the, the, the meat of poetry gets stolen. He has to go respond to that. Everything he does is a response to something else, whereas Loki's just doing it just to, to just, just cause chaos and, 
subterfuge and, and trying right. to destroy the gods. You know, that's what it is. He's also yeah, the king. You can see that in the, uh, you know, right. Loki's Odin is the king. <laughs> Yeah, could be the king, baby. <laughs> what, what what we find in the epic though is um, we mentioned Gulvig Hather earlier. Her, she and Loki cause the gods, cause Odin specifically to do these things. I mean, there's there's specific reasons the gods end up breaking the laws, and it's usually through an action that either Gulvig Hather or Loki has taken that forces them into a situation where they have to. So. Loki is really the bad example. Loki, not just Loki, but Hather as well. And she's the one who goes unrecognized. She's not mentioned in any of the popular books. The scholars debate about who Goldig Hather is at all. Sometimes they think she's Freya, which is ridiculous when you understand who Freya is. Right. So I just once again, it's underscoring why the epic method is so important. When you can make the connections between the myths, you can see the broader story, and you can see the causes and the consequences, the causes and effects. And that's what's missing from all the popular interpretations of the mythology. And that's what most of these, these um, I don't want to insult them, but like the play pagans, the plagans, the that's, what, that's what they're following. They're picking and choosing what they want. They're taking gods from different pantheons. They're praising Loki as though he's some sort of a hero. They have no idea who Loki is. And that's right. really what it boils down to. And the best way to defeat these people in an argument is not to be baited by them, but just to keep giving mythic examples because they, they can't fight against that. They can give a few, but you can give all the connections and the counter arguments. That's how, what I typically do. And they just shut up after a while because right. they can't, they, they don't have any depth of knowledge. And now with these laws, we have like a whole new set of, of, of weapons to go after them with, you know, it's, it just becomes undeniable, you know, yeah, how, how I look at it, it's building it's building our own culture. I, I don't need to go after pagans. Right. And of course yeah. I can, but they tend to go after us. Right. <laughs> because we have something yeah. that they want. I mean, yeah. they, we can get out there and talk about about the myths in a deep way. And I, I really think a lot of people envy that. So yeah. I think that's why, I mean, if, if you're not being attacked, you're, I mean, if you are being attacked, you're doing something right. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. People want right. what you have. Right. But I do think that it is important to remember that, you know, to go back to our in-group, out-group morality, that we are living in a plural society. You know, there are a lot of cultures around us. Um, and just as we don't necessarily need to honor our rules when dealing with people outside of our group, we also, I think, should not necessarily expect people outside of our group to follow our own rules. Right. Um, because if we start going that path, then that's where you get into other people then trying to enforce their religious laws on us, um, you know, so. Well, I think that one that, thing that we- What William said, and in that in the, I think, you know, we're trying to build our own culture, our own society here. And so long as what other people are doing is not in any way imposing on us or, or uh, damaging us or attacking us, then that's their business. Exactly. Be respectful of those cultures and just keep building your own. That's that's the best defense. Just keep yeah. building your own. This is this is something that that you know I see all the time. You know, the unis, they just us existing makes their skin crawl. Yeah. Right. And they really hate it when you press them. Like you guys aren't you guys are McPagans, right? Yeah. You guys are like a McDonald's cheeseburger version of a of a of what we are. Well, right? I think I think I think it's so funny. Like they sit there and swear up and down that they're not influenced by corporate media, but like their whole thing, their whole theology is built around the whole like uh, you know, he's not the some father, he's the all father. It sounds like a, you know, like ba da ba ba ba. I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's exactly what it is. It's just exactly slogans, it is. man. It's like not even real, you know. It's like uh it's just so like fake, you know, and and I think that like in delving in this stuff, you know, continue looking at the linguistics and the mythology and then the, the, the overall culture, you start to open up these windows and these doors and they just keep expanding and expanding. And it gets to a point where it's like, you're just standing on top of this mountain of evidence and you're just looking down and you're, and it's like, you guys, you never even cracked open a book. You don't, you never even looked at any of this stuff. You're just thinking that you did, you know? And, and the one thing that I see a lot of these people do is they, they, they live, they exist by uh, um, cults of personality and appeals to authority, right? Like you'll see some of them will just create all these fake like titles and degrees and all this stuff. And they have like 50 of them on their, 
on their thing and they're like, you know, I, I was this and that and that. So you must listen to me now. And I'm like, dude, if you don't have the arguments to back up what you're saying, I don't care what your degree is or titles or any of that stuff. It means nothing to me. Right. Yeah. They, they worship credentialism. It's right. Really, really it, it's it really is. Weird. It's like the whole like they're experts thing, you know, and it's like, well, the experts can show you that they're experts by their arguments, not by their degrees, you know. And so um, with that, there was one other thing I wanted to go over. Um, if we could, but, you know, uh, close it out with this is that, you know, we talked about the trickster archetype. And I, I'd really, really recommend anybody to go on YouTube and look at our channel and look at our uh, mythological schools of thought. I am working on an epic method school of thought video, but it's just taking me a long time because I got a bunch of stuff to do. But um, where uh, but it will show you how these things were interpreted and the school, the exact people who set it up, what they were doing, what they represented, what they say with their own words. And when we look at the archetypal school, like that's the big thing, that's, that's Wicca. You know, Wicca is a, an archetypal school belief system, you know, which is nothing. It's atheism. It's just like, nothing's real. It's all just figments of your imagination. And when we're looking at the trickster archetype and all this stuff, the, um, one of the things I found, because I was looking for in the sources, like, is there anywhere it mentions that Loki's a trickster? And I actually found in a translation, it says that one of Loki's names is trickster. But I was like, well, okay, let's look at that, though. So I looked at the original Old Norse, and they had changed the word. They had changed the word. It was uh, La Vizi, right? And La Vizi means he who knows guile. La, L-A-E, the, -A, the A and E blended. Uh, and, and Keith can go over this more in depth. You know, it's, it means guile and VC means to know. It doesn't mean trickster. It has nothing to do with that. But they just translated that because it fits a model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, la, yeah, guile, uh, craft, um, trickery. Well, trickery, but really not because in English, trick can kind of have like a fun note, uh, you know, connotation. Whereas guile, really, it's like artifice. It's lying. Right. It's deception. Subterfuge um, trickery. Yeah. Um, and you see another form of this this name actually also in... Um, in Bolispa, it's called uh, lag yarn, uh, guile prone. Um, so yeah, in in the yeah, I, I again, I would just reinforce that that this is not the same thing as trickery. It's it's really different. Um, deception is talked about as really much a bad thing here, right. and and we see the clear examples of how how this behavior plays out. Right. I, I would like to add something. Um, Mark has created a series of videos about the schools of interpretation and what I'd like to, and they're very important. I would highly recommend those. Um, there have been multiple interpretations of this lore over um, the course of about 300 years. This doesn't go all the way back to pagan times. These documents have not been known since pagan times. Um, Edic scholarship started about 300 years ago and there has been dominant schools of interpretation about every 50 years. So our goal at some point is to see the epic school as the dominant theory of interpretation because it in my opinion is the best uh, most consistent interpretation of the mythology so I, what we're doing appears to be different and it, it is not in agreement with the mainstream scholars but it has complete merit and anyone who studies this and uh, adopts this method will see that and that's the, our goal is is to promote that um, by exemplifying it, by talking about it, by uh, producing books using this method. So um, that's why what we're doing is is different and I think more important in many ways. Right. And, and, it, and it, it's a, for people who don't know what the epic method is, uh, I would just like to give a just a really brief description. It's like what we do is we cross reference the material with the material. Right. The Germanic material gets cross referenced with other Germanic material to find what we call lines of convergence so we can understand what it is, what it is that was being discussed. And we build arguments around that. And this bit, this is built upon the principle that our ancestors would tell a sacred epic that would break down the entire worldview and it would show a chronology. And we see that in Voluspa. And then we see that and throughout the stories, it just the pieces start falling to falling together and you start seeing this puzzle sort of unravel. And once you see the epic, you can't unsee it. it. It's there, right? And and we believe like you know, this they told these stories, and the, the sort of the grander epic was was part of this. And then other stories would get told, and they would become like local fairy tales and different things like that. That sort of became like the folkloric aspect of this, right? And so there is a the epic school and what we're doing today is sort of building that because we know that this is a religion. 
And that was what Ryberg, Victor Ryberg, was kind of the starter of all this. Um, he had this revolutionary idea that if you're going to examine an ancient people's religion, you should do so as a religion. It's not crazy, you know, but none of the other guys, no one was doing, no one ever did it. And a lot of them don't do that. They don't see it as a religion. It's not a religion. It's just a bunch of savage barbarians doing weird stuff. And, you know, they worship trees and rocks and, and stuff like that, you know, and they're just, they just, it's nothing, you know, and the Hindus, like with the nature school and stuff like that, the Hindus saw this and were just like, please stay away from our religion. You guys don't talk, touch this because they were furious when Max Mueller came out with his interpretations in the nature school or what's called the German school. They were like, you don't mess with our stuff, right? You don't know it. You don't understand it. This is our sacred scripture. Keep away. You know, and it shows you like really where it stands. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome stuff. All right, fellas. I want to, I want to hit some questions in the chat here and, you know, uh, we'll raise them to the panel and we'll go through them. So let's get started. Let's go up to the top here. Make sure there's um, no Lokians like screaming at their top of their lungs, one of our, <laughs> one of our heads on pikes. <laughs> Nobody, well, before we, before we do that, I put a poll when we first started, uh, Loki worship, uh, option one, legit. Option two, send them to the bog. Unanimously, 100% send them to the bog. To the bog you go. To the bog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, let's see here. What do we got? Um, uh, Tio Rima says, and he, he clarifies later. He says, any comment on following the old faith living in other continents of the world? Yeah. Uh, and then he clarifies, he says, South America being of Germanic and Portuguese families, but born in South America. Uh, if I would answer this, I'd say, do you, bro? You know, yeah. you're trying yeah, to make sure. Well, and, and I would also say that um, we see in the Icelandic sagas numerous instances of people you know, carrying their gods with them. I mean, when they went to Iceland, they, they were not living in Iceland at the time, and they they brought their uh, their high sea pillars and they they prayed to their gods and they brought that with them. Um, right. Same case even in the I know they're you know very contentious, but in the Vinland sagas, um, you know you see a it's funny because they're clearly written by a Christian, so there's uh, some pretty heavy duty Christian propaganda in there. But there is a character who is praying to Thor um, because they're starving to death and he prays for divine intervention. So. Right. People brought their gods with them to other lands, so there's nothing wrong. I was also like to point out that uh, countries, uh, borders, lines drawn around to identify countries are political constructs. It's not saying that they're bad. It's not saying that borders are bad. We should get rid of borders because that's a terrible idea. But the, I, the the truth is that they are political constructs. Now they could be political constructs to serve a nation. The problem is that the word nation. Uh, according to modern people, is a very modernized, liberalized understanding of nation, whereas the word nation comes from the Latin word, the Roman word, natio, which means from whence you were born, meaning that you could be part of a nation and live in completely different continents. We, the Germanic peoples, uh, the, 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 the sons of Odin, live all over the world, and we are one nation. And this is how the, the Native Americans view themselves, hence the Iroquois nation and all this kind of stuff, all kinds of different nations, right? Um, the Hebrews, the Hebrew nation, Hebrews are all over the world. They live in, you know, in New York and New Jersey and places still, but they are, you know, they view themselves as one. They, this is a nation, right? So it doesn't matter that you were born within the political construct of, say, I don't know, Argentina or Belize or Brazil or something like that. If you are the, the son of the gods or the daughter of the gods, then you are, right? It doesn't matter what language you speak, where you are, where you're born. It doesn't matter where you're born. It matters from whence you were born. That includes you within the nation, right? And that's patrilineal descent going all the way back to the All-Father himself. So that's how I would – you guys uh, take any issue with how I answered that uh, question there? Well, the thing I tell people is that you know, race is not tribe, but tribe always becomes race, yeah. right? It's a more direct way of looking at it because it's like um, you show me a picture of any actual real unbroken tribe that exists and they all look the same. It's because yeah. they're all intermarried. They're all connected and it just becomes a genetic feature. And that's what we see on, when we're looking at DNA and all these different things. That's what you're looking at is ancient tribes that expanded and expanded and expanded and became nations, became people. Amen. And I would also like to point out that race is a scientific category. Exactly. The, your, the importance of, of your features and everything like that 
the reason that that like folk like being part of a folk is meaningful is because that these are features that are given to us by the gods lao lati litrgoda right our hair our our godly complexion goodly complexion um blood all of this stuff our physical features are gifts from the gods that is what makes it meaningful it's not meaningful because it is it's meaningful because it it you know it's who we are it's where we were born right so um that's what gives it meaning so let's uh so concluding if you're in south america bro do you you as far as i'm as far as i'm seeing it and i'm not saying this doesn't justify like hating on people i'm not a hater i want to put that out there i don't hate nobody i've i've met friendly great people from all kinds of different you know places and you know births and all that so i'm not i'm not a hater so um okay so there's some more questions uh i've seen sources saying skavi is a jotun do you guys believe this is to be true from Germany. that's a william question <laughs> yeah <laughs> get ready <laughs> uh Scotty is the daughter of Diazi boland and Diazi boland is the father sorry the son of an elf and a giantess so yes she has giantess blood in her veins but i believe that skathy is the daughter of ifen who is an elf we're told she's an elf elfer in uh, her off nagalder odin six i believe and um Theazi, um, we can, looking at various passages, can tell that he's the son of an elf and a giantess, and he and Skate, he and Hyden, Hyden share the same father. And because they spent a lot of time together, uh, Skate and Skate, he comes right after Theazi dies. It's more than likely Hyden is her mother. So she has some giantess blood in her, but she she's not affiliated with the giant, giants, the Jotun, so I wouldn't call her a Jotun myself. Also, she marries Njord, who is a, you know. And then Odin. She's the bride. She's the bride of gods, plural. Right. And, uh, so, uh, okay. So we go to Terry Warwick says, um, they want people to worship Fenrir and Loki. And if you don't, then you are not being inclusive. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think I actually think that their whole thing about inclusivity and all those like political angles is literally they just they hate the religion. They hate they want to blaspheme the religion and they want to uh, include Satanism or okay. Luciferianism or some kind of weird occultic garbage. I think that they're they're the the political angle that they take is a cope for something that's actually far more sinister. Well, just the very idea of being inclusive of anything is weakness. You know, it's just the idea that you're going to bow to anything. Like, I'm going to include anything. Like child molesters, like, oh, yeah, let's include them. Let's just include people who like to, you know, eat people. I mean, you know, there, there are pagans in Africa that eat people, you know, and that's a part of some of the cultures there. Um, you have the virgin cure and stuff like that in some societies and um, sorcery cults in Haiti. We're going to include all that, you know. Um, at some point, you have to make assertions. You have to make religious assertions and set boundaries. If you have no boundaries, you're just a weak human being who just puts up with anything. And, and they absolutely, they absolutely do. Uh, so many, so many scandals come out of their communities with perverts and pe kid, like people that touch kids and all kinds of sick, horrible stuff that you'd never hear from from us, right? Because we are completely vigilant of of people that could possibly be like that. Because that's we have a bog. We have, <laughs> we have a bog. We have a bog. Yeah. So. And I would say specifically. I'm sorry. There's there's no there's no historic evidence of of worship of Loki or Finner, and yeah. Yeah. and I would also add that just like Loki is found. Sorry, go ahead. No, you no, you're fine. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I just there's no historic evidence of that. And when you when you see when you have the complete epic, you wouldn't want to worship Loki or Finner. There, there's no reason to well what we can do is like basically make the comparison to what we started with our discussion is the the bacchanalia right where you had like this sacred religion that was holy and devout to bacchus and then these rich spoiled degenerates come along and they turn it into a big orgy fest like that's what's happening with this you know it's I, like i think the, a lot of these i think a lot of these people who worship loki they see themselves as outcasts and so they they see loki as some sort of wronged outcast it's a very limited interpretation of the mythology. They're glomming on to something to justify their own feelings and their own background. Right. Also, what's what's wrong with you that you're an outcast? 
why we just kicked out. Well, you know what I mean? we just right. promote what we do, not worry about them. Yes. You know, build. All I can build, really build. Yeah, they, yeah. waste your time on that. Just protect your own, build your own culture. Yeah. I was going to say this before, but it's like they like hate us so bad, but they just like. You think if they hate us so it's not like what are you, we're not going away. What are you gonna do? Come around and try to kill us all? Like we're still gonna be here. Why don't you just like ignore us and let us go? Because we don't want to hang out with you scumbags either. So why why even harass us? Just like in my opinion. Alone. In my opinion, they're fighting their own demons. They 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 have their own inner problems and they're just lashing out. We just happen to be the, the most convenient to lash out as because we don't agree with their their views. We we have boundaries and they don't want to have boundaries. Well, yeah. don't have boundaries over there. Right. <laughs> right. Boundaries here. So. Yeah, be yourself by yourself. <laughs> Stay exactly. away from me. To quote Pantera. <laughs> uh, for, for the person in the other country, find your tribe. Just find find the people that you feel comfortable with. Not not everyone should accept everyone else. We should respect other people, but we don't have to accept everything they do. You can't. You, you have to be, you have to have some sort of boundary and judgment just to survive in the world. There are people who will take advantage of you if you don't. So it's just, that's common sense. All people do this. Well, well the one thing I would also say in, in just trying to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit of compassion towards a lot of these people is that I really honestly believe that what we're looking at is just a product of the machine. You know, we see the propaganda, we all see it, right? But we're all strong enough to criticize it and see it for what it is. But a lot of people don't, man. And that's why we're so angry about it. That's why we get mad about it. Because we know there's a lot of impressionable people, especially young people, who see this stuff. And they're like, this is the way to be. This is great. We should do this. And they don't realize that it's just a bunch of wealthy perverts and degenerates and disgusting human beings that are exploiting you and manipulating you into making the world what they want it to be. Because that's what they want. So we got a good question here from Ian Perry. This is... This is a this is a more practical question. It says, how do you teach one's children the true old ways with heavy resistance from other family and the modern world around us? This is a humongous, humongous question, a humongous problem for a lot of people. Um, there are folks out there that are going to struggle with judgments from their family. Maybe their family or some kind of really hardcore Christian, or maybe they're you know just as bad some kooky atheist people, or like you know, whatever that don't like it, or they're going to have pushback on you. Right. Um, it, other family in the modern world is another problem. You know, you can't, you know, go to a. So let me answer your question here, Mr. Perry. And then I'll let these guys chime in. Uh, as far as teaching your children, dog, your dad, you are a paterfamilias. That is your household. If your family can't accept the way that you teach your children, then they can get lost, take a hike. You know what I mean? And this is pretty tough because there's going to be, th this isn't easy, right? What we're doing here is not easy. We're not doing this because this is a fun, this is a game. We're doing this because this is true and this is right. And because we have been called by the high holy powers to, to fulfill our destinies here. So it's like, if you got to tell, you know, aunt so-and-so or whatever to take a hike, sometimes you're going to have to do that. And you're going to have to eat that and you're going to have to be used to that and you have to choose. You can't simultaneously live in two worlds sometimes. So you're going to have to choose. Right. And unfortunately, that's just the way it is. As far as the modern world, uh, what did it say? There's a I'm terrible at reciting things, but there's a stanza in Hovel Mall that says if your your neighbor is your enemy, trade lie for a lie and smile for a smile. So spears may not be drawn. Right. Something like that. Yeah, he's like, oh, close it up. <laughs> That's about three different verses blended into one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, it, but what it's what it's saying is that you know you shouldn't be just like out of your way starting beef. If you got to to keep peace, keep frith, you know, say what you got to say. And that's how I do when you know, for example, when I'm at a job, if I'm at work, if I'm working like a like a, like a day job, I don't I don't want to say I'm going to bloat. I don't want to, I don't say my kindred. I don't say this and that. I say church. I say I'm going to church because I don't have to, because a lot of times if I, it, first of all, they're going to be, oh, what's that? And I have to try to explain them something that they probably won't understand. And if they do understand it, they might not like it and judge me and act stupid. And it's just not a worthwhile thing, right? I'm not scared. I don't, I don't, 
hide who I am, anything like that. But sometimes it is more useful and has better utility to just use common language and blend in and kind of go under under the radar. Right. I'm going to I'm going to church because here's the deal. Say you're you have a manager at your job and you need to get off to go to bloat or go to an event or something like that. You know, they're not going to understand and they might not take seriously when you say that. Right. But it's important that you make it to bloat. So say you're going to church and uh, say, you know, your pastor or your your uh, freaking priest or whatever is going to write you a note. Right. We could do that. We could do that. That's in the United States. It is pretty hairy stuff to deny an employee access to, to religious events. People, the companies get sued over that. And the easiest way to do it in, in my in my experience is just to kind of like skip all the explanations and the big talky talk and just use language parlance that they're familiar with. Uh, one thing I would like to say, because you know, I'm, I, I got four kids and I've been doing this a long time as a dad, right? Is that um, don't look for just a one easy catch all answer. You know, being a parent is always difficult. There's always challenges, right? But one thing I would tell you to do is that you're looking at, you know, and, and that you're, this answers directly your question is you're facing a Goliath. You're facing like literally the greatest propaganda machine that was ever devised by human beings, created by extremely wealthy and extremely powerful people with lots of resources. So that means you first off, before you even look at the religion, you have to make your kids incredibly strong. Every one of my kids trains jujitsu. Every one of my kids are champions, right? They just we just did a competition today and they both came home with medals. My eight year old destroyed a girl 15 to zero, you know. And I, treat, I teach my kids to be strong. I teach them how to fight. They're all girls. I got four girls, right? And I teach them propaganda. It's important for you to not tell them, not to dictate what the message is, but to, dig, to show them how messaging works. Because if you show the ins and outs of it, and this is something William and I have gone over many, many times, is when you're explaining something to someone, let them make the discovery. Because if they make the discovery, then it's, it's such a bigger moment for them. So like, you know, I, I've told this story before when my, when my uh, daughter Elsa was uh, younger, she wanted to go get a drink, right? And they had this new drink and they called it Dragon's Blood, right? And there was, she was like, oh, I want some Dragon's Blood, Dad. It's so cool. It's such a neat drink. And I was that's like, cool, sweetie, man. like, I was like, that's nothing. <laughs> you know, I was like, it's just red sugar water. And she was like, no, like it's Dragon's Blood. I was like, I said, kiddo, they take some sugar, they take some water, they carbonate it and they put like red number five in it. She goes, What's red number five? And I started explaining it to her. And then the red number five became our code for everything that's baloney, right? <laughs> it's just garbage. It's like, dad, that's red number five right there. I was like, yes, it is. That's red number five. Yeah. But it lets them see through lies. And when you give them that strength and that confidence to see through the lies, then you tell them the truth. And that's, and then, then it's like opens up the whole world. Um, and then I would add, that uh, you know, when you're in this kind of situation, you need to remember that you are, whether you like it or not, an ambassador for our faith, for our religion. So when you are, you know, trying to to teach this um, and and perpetuate this religion against opposition, you need to hold yourself to the highest standard, um, because if the people around you are decent people, then they will recognize that you are a person of high values of good morals, they will recognize that your heart is in the right place, that you are supporting the right things, that you are living a good life, that you are going to teach your children to live a good life. And if they're good people, they will learn to accept the rest and, and maybe learn a little bit about it on the way. And that's been my experience. Um, you know, it's been a long journey, but just always making clear what this religion is actually about, not letting them get lost in the weeds of, you know, what names, you know, what are the names of the gods that we're praying to? And, you know, and what are we, what are we calling this and what languages are we using? You just, you focus on the things that they can relate to. You focus on what we value. You focus on what we don't allow. You know, the fact that we are hard against you know, like lying and murder and cheating and backstabbing, you know, all of the bad things and that we are in favor of family and working hard and, you know, and being smart and, and taking care of each other, then, then the rest should hopefully fall into place. And if they can't understand it, even then, then they're probably people you don't want to be around. Yeah. Uh, real recognize real, right? If you show that you're authentic, the people, good people respect that. Good people. I have a ton of Christian. Do I have Christian friends that come like hang out when we do bloat and stuff? Like they're they're like the token Christian guy, and they like hanging out with us because we're just cool, 
right? And they respect the hell out of us because they like to hear us sing our galders. They like to watch the bloat. To them, you know, they, it's a different belief, but they're they're there for the food and they're to hang out and show love and stuff like that. You know, I'm not going to turn them away. You know, I'm, I'm I believe very deeply in hospitality, right? So if they want to come and hang out and learn more and be friends, hey. I, I totally let that happen. It's not like they're coming in mass, you know, one or two or whatever. And then I got Christian friends that I do, you know, do business with and stuff online and with the books or just that I interact with. And they just, they were, it's starting to turn. It's really, really turning around because they could see that I'm really about this. You know, I could really, I stand on, on what I am and they respect that. You know what I mean? And I respect them too. Cause they actually, you know, they, they at least they believe something. Right? They believe in something higher than themselves, and they're really about it. Real recognize real. And that's just, you know, that's a, that, a, that goes across the board. So people out there, they might, you know, whatever. But if they see that you're really about it, it's not a joke, it's not a game, it's not archetypes, whatever. You are really a devotional, theistic. Like, theism is in the word polytheism, right? You can't, like, d- separate them, right? To be a polytheist, you have to believe in theism, right? So yeah. when they see that you're really a theist and you're really about it, you know, a lot of times they 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 show the respect and the love. So that, as as Keith said, if if they if somebody in your life and they can't show you love and they can't show you respect and respect who you are and what you're about and what you believe, then fuck them. Get them out of there. They're not somebody. Sorry for the F. I'm trying to get rid of my Fs. I only did one F today. I only did one F. So you're like the FCC for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, try, I'm trying to clean it up, right? I'm trying to clean it up. But turn it over a new leaf these days. But, um, yeah, so that's all I'd have to say uh, about that. Um, um, do we, have, we had some other questions. I'm, like, having trouble finding in the chat. Um. I think that's, I think, I think we're, somebody said something about some guy did a bloat uh, to Fenrir. They called him the liberator from chains and paralleled his struggle to, you know, different types of people. Um, What are you talking about? So, yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these people are just using it as a way to virtue signal, right? Right. In today's world, it's the, the victim Olympics, right? The, the more oppressed you are, the, the higher status you become. They're just they're they're posturing for for uh, status is what it is. Well, and, it's also like the idea of like a lot. So much stuff comes from Hollywood. You know, I mean, it's like when I started uh, introducing to people the idea that our ancestors more than likely sang their bloats. Right. People were just appalled. They were just like, what are you talking about? There's no possible way. You know, but then I present presented the evidence and people you know they didn't really talk so much about it but the thing is is that people are have like this personification of this religion that like comes from hollywood where you see like the person in the dark robes and it's all like dark and there's fog and it's ominous and they're like you know speaking in big tones and they're so dramatic and it's like they think that's the religion that's their vision of it that's their mindset of it and it's like when we come along and you see us chanting and singing and it's something that looks devout and devotional. They're like, whoa, that looks like Christianity. I can't do that, you know? And you're just like, no, dude, like this is like, there's no religion on earth that doesn't sing their ceremonies. Mm-hmm. None, you know, all ceremonies are sung. That's how ceremonies work. Yeah. That's uh, it's like Christianity has a monopoly on beauty. Right. Like, come on. Or yeah. singing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's another that's a that's another thing. It's uh, our ancestors were very very big on aesthetics and and beauty. They held beauty very very high, not just physical beauty, but they wore beautiful garb. They wore colorful clothes. They wore gold. They used. It was such a big deal for our ancestors, especially for the the, the later. They would uh, paint their house because they would paint their houses. They would make fake red dye to paint their houses so they would look rich, right? right? So they red, you know, yeah red was a color of wealth. They, 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 when we were looking at the the blotkladi, right, the, uh, the the clothing, like in all those sources where I was citing that they were using red clothes and stuff like that. Every one of those sources were like that was like his best red red outfit, super expensive. You know, he's like all flashing it like a pimp. He's coming in there, yeah. you know, like, hey, look at me in my red outfit. You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, but that's what they were doing. They were showing that like you know this is this was something high class and and this is wealth and represents that. You know, yeah. 
who we got here real quick we're gonna close it up anybody has questions get them in now we're gonna close it up but um jamie sundin says i always appreciate when keith sings at our bloats yeah his calder is amazing oh it's fantastic so i got to hang out with uh, Mark and Keith at FSH this year, and we had so much fun. And Keith does indeed has actually. I I was surprised. He's got a great singing voice, and really, I was like, damn, I didn't know all that, right? <laughs> so he did Surprise. the. It was it was very impressive. He does a My wonderful job. Career. <laughs> Hell yeah! Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So that's it. Would you guys like to uh, have anything to say in closing before we wrap this up here? Uh, I would just like to close and, you know, like maybe we could do with like we began, you know, is uh, do a round on it. But um, I would just say, you know, that the people, whether, you know, we're talking about Loki or we're talking about something else. The idea is that, you know, we have to look at things from an educated standpoint and you educate yourself by looking at the source material, not listening to cults of personality or authority figures, not even us. You know, listen to the sources, look at what's being said in those sources and examine it yourself instead of just jumping to conclusions and making assumptions or listening to other people who are doing the same thing. Because we've seen and we've demonstrated that these people, often, as a lot of people have agendas or they're following a specific school of thought that tells them to be, behave this way. And you have to look at things objectively and you have to use evidence to back up your, your claims. Yeah, absolutely agree with that, um, would second that. And I would say that you know this should apply not only to you know, your pursuit of our own religion, but if you feel like you've got to be for a critique with another religion, do your legwork. Don't just start you know, railing about something that you don't know anything about. If, if you have a question or an issue with Christianity, read the Bible. Learn a little bit about it. You know, if, if you want to actually talk to some, you know, to some Muslims, then read the Quran. Um, you know, then you're going to understand them a little bit better. Uh, and you're, you're speaking from a place of education. And, and those are going to be, um, you know, educational experiences because we live with a lot of people who believe in different things and you got to understand what they're about um yes red bloat Freddy is the most awesome i disagree um, i think white well we see white is present and is important for other things but i i wouldn't consider it to be the standard just because we have a lot of it's but that's a whole in other all, in all indo-european traditions they for the we priesthood about that it's white is for the priesthood red is for the gathered right. Yes. But anyway, uh, so yeah, do your legwork. Oh. Look at the evidence. If somebody's not showing you the evidence, then you should be skeptical. Um, Mark is really great about doing that in his work. William as well. I really cannot speak highly enough about the, both of their both of their work. I really love Odin's Wife. It, it was a it's a very dense book, but it is um, transformative in your understanding about free, I think. And it really was critical as well for me and my own uh, understanding of, of the Edda. Um, so really strongly encourage uh, Odin's wife. And then lastly, shameless plug for my uh, Volspa translation, please take a look at it. Um, I, you know, one, it, it helps me, but two, also I do get into a lot of these ideas that, that, that are really kind of being uncovered from the epic, epic method. So I'm just, I'm trying to get these ideas out there because I can only do so much. So I want people to kind of read that, critique it, uh, take it and run and do other stuff with it. That's what we're all about here. Um, you know, that's what Mark is always talking about with Neurona Society. We're trying to put out the best educational materials that we can so that people can take that, build upon it, because this is a living religion. Mm. Mm. All right, well, before we shut it down, I'd like you guys to go around and just give links, give books, whatever you guys got, and I'm gonna put them in the description below later. Guys, you guys listening, Dude, like, share, subscribe, all that good YouTube stuff. You know, you guys hear all the other YouTubers say it. Yo, helps me fight the algorithm and all that stuff. It does. Algorithm sucks. So give us a like and a share here if you like the bog. And keep your eyes peeled for hearthfireradio.com, which is coming any day now. It's getting loaded. It's done. It's like getting loaded with stuff. It's going to be a, a it's gonna be like a fortress of great content for the folk. So you guys are going to love that. Hearthfireradio.com. Keep your eyes peeled. So, Mike, Keith, William, tell them where to buy books. Tell them where to find your stuff. All that. Let William start. William, you start. You already mentioned my site, um, GermanicMythology.com. It's free, no charge. Um, all kinds of information there if you just want to study. I've always encouraged study. 
So that's that's really what I'm about. Um, my main books are Our Father's God Saga. It's a translation of Victor Rydberg's um, Fidernus Gudesager. And um, I've translated a couple other of his works, um, mainly the second volume of his Mythic Studies. Um, a large part of that is also on my website if people want to check that out. If they want a hard copy, they're at Amazon. It's called uh, Investigate Victor Rydberg's Investigations into Germanic Mythology. This is volume two. Keith just held them up. It's not um, Ras Rasmus Anderson's. Uh, he was ready. <laughs> yeah, it's not Rasmus oh, Anderson's volume. It's the sequel. So mm -hmm. it, it is unique in its own right. And I annotated it fully, tried to give modern sources. Um, Odin's Wife is a complete investigation of Frigg, um, the Mother Earth in Germanic mythology, covering almost a thousand years of material, showing the connections between it. Um, there are some unique interpretations in chapter 10 I would recommend people read. Um, and I have a forthcoming book called um, uh, Towards the Evidence, uh, The God Saga in Germanic Mythology. And it's a direct translation of Rydberg's. It's about a 72-page essay um, that he published one time in 1885. It's never been published since. So I'm working off a Danish translation of it. And that's, that's really pretty much it. Thank you. I appreciate the invite, by the way. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. You're very welcome, Mr. William. Great having you here, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Keith, you go next? Yeah, Keith, oh, go yeah. ahead. Tell us where to buy your books, bub. Yeah, so uh, my book you can find on Amazon. Um, you can search Bolispa, Keith Osga. Um, so uh, listed as translator and author. I translated. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there you go. Well, um, I don't have any books it, to hold up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but then also um, it's it's got a ton of notes. Uh, the translation portion is really just like half of the book. Um, the other half is just an insane amount of footnotes. Um, I break down the language. I break down the stanzas. Like what are the what are the poetic references mean? I cross reference it with other edit poems, and then I have a series of essays at the end where I talk about some bigger topics. Like for instance, as William mentioned before. Um, the figure of Goldick Hather, that witch, who's kind of the female counterpart of Loki. Since she is so pivotal to the epic, I, I really tell her story there, and I try to tie that together, as well as a number of other characters and terms that I consider to be um, both very important to and often misunderstood in the study of the mythological epic. So check out uh, Amazon, Volispa, Key Basket. Thank you. Yeah, and and every, a lot of people know me. I'm the director of the Norna Society. Um, we're all over, you know, social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, Instagram, all that stuff. Uh, we have an Amazon, you know, section. Uh, you see a lot of our books on there. I've, I've written the Ostruetta, the Odinistetta, Ivan Runer is my newest book. Um, I went it now. Ivan Runer is the book that I um, I put together where I, you know, after years and years and years of dealing with books writing about ritual and how rituals perform and all that stuff. And it's all these things people make up. I, I actually had one of those books myself where I was trying to put stuff together. Um, the Cinda book. <laughs> Thanks guys. The Otis book. That's a philosophy book I put together. Um, the, uh, the Ivan Runner really like a, a book one just delves into the research. Like what is ritual? How does it work? What do all the sources say on it? We piece together. Like there's literally like probably over 200 citations in there. You know, there's just filled it with as much information as I possibly could. And then we wrote book two, which takes Edic passage, Skaldic poetry, different things, and turns it into rituals. So everything you have in there is from the source material, including the name of the book. Avn Runer comes from Rix Thula, where uh, Heimdall is teaching us the gods. So you can see that on Amazon. You can see all my books on Amazon. So, yeah. You know. And I, if I would just add, um, I just as a further plug to your stuff, Mark, um, if you really want the, the resources for practice of our religion, Avonrin or one and two are, I think, absolutely essential. Laying out the That's research right. for our rituals and then actually giving you um, really excellent framework for doing them. So that is, I think, those are the top two books for actually practicing our religion. I mean, a lot of people will, will talk about books that they get into lore and they get into, you know, the big ideas, but those two are essential if you want to do so I and both of these both of these gentlemen with me helped me put this together it's not just my undertaking you know william helps me figure out the connections in the lore keith helps me figure out the language i mean i'm not an old norse scholar you know and and nobody knows myths better than william reeves i'm sorry there's no there's no academic out there that he can even touch the guy 
I'm just saying that right now. And I'm, I, I feel yeah. privileged, privileged and honored to work with these guys on a daily basis because you, I mean, I, I'm sorry if you believe that either one of these guys don't know what they're doing, just get in a debate with them. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> You're going to regret that. <laughs> William right. Reeves will activate the wall of text on Man, you. Man, I've had people, I've had people <laughs> message me begging me to make him stop. <laughs> like, could you please turn it off? I'm like, nope. <laughs> there are times. I, I really I love you. the research. I just yeah, do. It does. <laughs> and I'll help anybody. If anyone wants help, ask me. I'll do what I can, but I'll point you in the right direction if nothing else. And my site's there with all kinds of stuff I've found. I put it together for myself so I, because I got tired of looking up all these things, but I put it up there so other people can do what I do. I don't have any special skills. So there yeah, you do. I have, well, <laughs> I have a love for this and I've done it since about 84, 1984. So anybody can do what I did. Nice. Just follow, longer I've been alive. Follow Rydberg's method. That's right. that's the key to all of it. And he goes directly to the sources. Yep. So it's not he's not creating stuff. He's just putting things together. It's what Mark was saying earlier about uh, it's an invest it's comparing sources to sources. It's the comparative method within the Germanic sphere and it yields amazing results. So, which Mark's books, he just amazes me every time he comes out with something new. I, he, he sees things from angles that I haven't seen. And working with Keith on his Volus by translation, just as a sounding board and talking about the verses was absolutely amazing. I learned things about Volus by that I haven't seen in there. Me too. And his book is so important because he gives both both um, a translation of both manuscript versions of Volus All the Volus copies that you see in, in uh, published books, they're a they're a hybrid of the two manuscripts. It's very important to read the manuscripts individually because they have very different approaches. And you they Keith touched on some of that, but highly recommend his book Volispa. Right. Most people didn't even know there were two poems. Mm -hmm. You know. So yeah. Keith brought that to light, buddy. Thanks. Okay. Well, hey, uh, it was started by uh, by Norton Society. It was, you know, there was a big call for it, so yep. you just yeah. got to step up. Don't let anyone time. tell you that there aren't sources for what we do. We've got tons of sources. The key is how to interpret them. Right. So, and yeah. what we're doing is nothing unusual. It's different than what the mainstream scholars do because we see this as an actual religion. We don't see it as a bunch of barbarians just sitting around a campfire creating stories. Right. And I can yeah. say that, but when you really dig into scholarship, that is kind of the underlying premise. And they're using Snorri Zetta as, as the main means to, to interpret the older heathen poems. And Snorri was not a heathen, and he specifically advocates Christianity and it's a Christian interpretation of the myths. And we can show that in multiple ways, um, just comparing the poetry to his Edda. It's yeah. not hard to do, and I'll, I'll be happy to show anyone who's willing to listen. Likewise. And he will, too. There were times on, like, Telegram where I asked him a question. It's like one sentence, and then he, t like, types it up. You it's got not a book, copy and paste. He types <laughs> me up, like, like 6,000 words, and then also 40 minutes worth of voice messages. That's it. <laughs> I do that is because I know that you're not the only one listening. I know that there's right. other people out there, and I get constantly I'm getting messages from people and or hearing somebody I, there was even a comment here in the, the thing people like what i do so when when i'm speaking to someone individually i'm aware that on these social media platforms there's a larger audience mm -hmm. so i'm not trying to overwhelm the individual person i'm just trying to spread the information and i really appreciate that mark and keith are doing the same thing when i started this years ago i just knew this this was a the right method and i just wanted other people to talk to about it and now i have that it's, you know, it's taken a long time, and I know they came to it, you know, on their own. But it's wonderful that the method, that Reinberg's method specifically, is getting such coverage that there's other people now taking up um, the task. That's, you know, I'm I'm happy that I translated Reinberg's works and that people are reading them. So. Oh yeah, oh yeah. All right, fellas, we are we went well, way over, way over, way, way over. <laughs> I do. I was like, towards the end, I was like, you know what? Let's go over. <laughs> when you, you said an hour and twenty minutes, I was like, that's ambitious. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. It's we all need good. To get it's all most good. Of the, uh, oh, line. <laughs> so, so, speaking of books, we're gonna shell some books right now, guys. Bizarre archives issue 
five. Go get it because Bizarre Archives issue six is coming any day now. Any day. It's going to drop any day. We also just dropped the case book of Patrick Midnight. I forgot to put it on my stack here, but go get that. If you like horror noir, 1920s, detective spooky stuff, go check it out. Masters of Horror series. It's like blurring me out here. Masters of Horror series. So if you like guys, what's in this one here? This is uh, volume two. Ambrose Bierce, Lovecraft, Arthur Mackin, E.T.A. Hoffman, Bram Stoker, Algernon Blackwood, the greats, the horror beneath, C.P. Webster, another great cosmic horror story. Go get that. We got House on the Borderland. This is like one of the very first cosmic horror tales of the 1920s. William Hope Hodgson, a absolute monster, a legend of the tradition that kind of got lost to history a little bit. And also, man, if you're a sci-fi guy, we got some OG sci-fi here. Hellflower from George O. Smith, which you can get over there. It's all blurred out. I see that, but go get that. If you like old school sci-fi, it is about a, um, it's about a dude that gets framed for a crime and from a, a criminal syndicate that, de that develops a drug made from Hellflower, which uh, is a, like something you spray on ladies and makes them, uh, see you as irresistible so right. it, it, he uh you know he's framed for a crime and all of these ladies are throwing themselves at him and he has to punch his way to victory clear <laughs> it's really old school right <laughs> well, I, well, I would like to say before we close like that you know we kind of talked about each other and all this stuff and like I, dave i really appreciate you and the bog and the show and the stuff that you're doing to present like heathen art and culture and stuff like that is so pivotal and so crucial to everything because this is how, like, this is like the stepping stone, man. And I really appreciate you, man. Like, I love you to death, dude. You're like a brother to me. And I just appreciate all the things that you do. Thank you so much, Mr. Mark. You as well, sir. All you guys, man. I love all you guys. You guys are great. I've learned so much from you guys. And I love all you guys out there, the bog lords and bog maidens out there tuning in, checking out their shows and supporting us for, man, this is like, this show is turning into like one of the pyramids. It's been here since the beginning, right? Yeah. So. We, we, uh, we've been here for a while and we're going to keep going until I, I'm falling out of my chair here. So, <laughs> guys, uh, Heartfire Radio is where the bog's going to be in the future. Check it out. Um, the Bizarre Archives, buy books. Check out Culture Dads, all the plugs you know. But, like always, hails and blessings to everybody. I'll see you guys next time here on the bog. Hail. Hail. If I can find our outro. <laughs>